Welcome to the first of several enlightening discussions we have planned for you today. My name is Maika Sampson, and for the last eight months or so, I've had the privilege of introducing myself as the Millennial Public Policy Fellow in the Family-Centered Social Policy Program here at New America. This panel, uh, new, per new Perspectives on Communities of Care, is split into two roughly 30-minute sessions with a Q&A at the very end. Um, in the first half of the panel, I am joined by Elisa Durana, the Senior Policy Analyst in the Better Life Lab, and Rosalind Miller, the Millennial Public Policy Fellow in the Better Life Lab. Um, in the second panel, Jenny, the Millennial Fellow from the Education Program, will lead a conversation with her colleagues, Ernest Nzuego and Abigail Swisher, members of the Pre-K through 12 program and the higher ed teams, respectively. So one of our goals for this, these conversations is to move past the whys, the justifications for care policy and to really get into the weeds of policy philosophy and, and design. Uh, we hope that by now we're in agreement that people need paid family leave, um, that the patchwork of American public assistance programs aren't doing enough to meet the needs and aspirations of their constituents, and that of course, American, and, American public and private education systems are failing to foster equity. It's easy to whip up a populist frenzy over what's obviously wrong, but it's much harder to focus our attention to the myriad of historical, social, and technical considerations that must be taken into account if we are to ever get things right. Eliza and Rosalind's work in the Better Life Lab exemplifies this com commitment and depth to research in the field. They research and write about barriers to social and income equality, especially at the intersections of work, gender, social and social policy. Before joining New America, Rosalind studied anthropology at Stanford University. Uh, her studies focused on urban structures and their relationships to the public and private sectors. And before jo joining New America, Elisa, uh, Elisa's work spanned the Department of Housing and Urban Development's Promise Zones initiatives. Um, she worked in social, social services in the Washington metro area. And she did Fulbright research on social policy integration in the EU. Um, Elisa, you recently authored an article that appeared in Slate on the Republican plan for paid family leave and I think it really highlights some of the issues we'd like to talk through today. Specifically, the messy things that happen when we come to a consensus on a good thing like paid family leave, but we have wildly different ideas about how to make that happen. And so to kick off our conversation, I wanted to ask the both of you um, if you could talk through some of the major points of this paid family leave uh, policy proposal and some of the, the philosophical issues it raises in American approaches to care policy. Sure, so uh, maybe to start, I don't know how familiar people are with paid family leave in the room, but um, there are currently two general proposals on the table. There, the Family Act, which was introduced by Senator Gillibrand and Representative DeLauro, uh, would create an insurance scheme so that people um, would pay into the scheme about a cup of coffee, the cost of a cup of coffee a day, and then when they need to take time off to have a child, to care for a loved one, or you know, undergo cancer treatment, something like that, that they would have the ability to take that time and not lose their source of income. So that has been introduced several times. It's basically a Democrat-only bill at this point. Um, there has been interest from the administration, um, which has now crossed over into Marco Rubio's office for to author a Republican plan. And so that plan um, has come together as a, sort of an extension of social uh, of so the social security system. So. In the, um, in the article that we authored last week, we were looking sort of at the merits of, of that bill. Um, surprisingly, or, or not so surprisingly, it's not particularly well thought out and would exacerbate funding issues within Social Security itself and also not be inclusive of uh, the, the needs that most families have. So in, in the case of that policy, the Republicans would like to um, fold parental leave into our current Social Security system, so uh, not even though the majority of people who take time off take time off for their own personal medical care, this would just be limited to new parents. And if new parents were to take time off pulling money out of their Social Security, they would have to delay retiring. Um, so there are, well, there are multiple concerns, or I have multiple concerns about that, mainly that we already see a lot of discrimination of new parents, particularly women, the wage gap emerges when um, when women are in their 20s and 30s, so that is one issue. And then the second um, is that the workers that probably need this the most, who probably need to retire early because they are in very physically or emotionally demanding fields, might not be able to if uh, they take time off to have a child and then can't retire when, when they're no longer able to work. So, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I, I completely agree with all of that. And I just want to add that right now, um, we're at a moment where people are finally putting family values first <laughs> in the sense that uh, paid family leave has not always had a consensus about its value. Um, right now in American workplaces, we expect people to adjust their lives, their families, to the nine to five or to the shift work or to whatever it is that people are working in rather than making workplaces work for people. Uh, and that's a huge problem that I think paid family leave could be a cornerstone of fixing. And um, right now about 14% uh, from 2016, that's kind of an old statistic, but about 14% of Americans have access to paid family leave. Meaning that if you need to you know, take six weeks off to give birth to your kid or to take care of a sick child or even an elder um, that doesn't have anyone else to take care of them, you have to sacrifice your salary, you have to sacrifice your position at work just to make sure that you can do those caretaking responsibilities. And that's not fair. Um, and when we passed the Family Medical Leave Act, that helped with a little bit. Uh, that provided unpaid leave for, is it 12 weeks? Yep. Up to 12 weeks. Um, and even, not all, not all Americans have access to that. Not all companies are big enough. Um, and yeah, why did we you put policy forward and say, this is important, this is valuable, but then not make sure that every worker has access to it or has the ability to take it? Yeah, and just to, I mean, a quarter of women in the U.S. go back to work within two weeks of having a baby because they can't afford to take time off. So not to mention, like, issues around people who are uh, disabled or, like, in the process of dying, or there are many reasons why people need time to take off, but uh, uh, yeah, so it's, the situation is fairly dire at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Definitely. I think um, part of the reason, well, I don't want to speculate too much, but part of the reason why uh, this proposed plan pulls from Social Security is over concerns about its cost. Um, frequently, the argument against developing robust safety net programs is that the cost will be enormous, and could you speak to that sort of scarcity framework and how it's framed other social policies. Sure, I mean, uh, I mean, Rosalind will also speak to this, but I think that we're in agreement that this is more a question of priorities and um, paid family leave would act as an insurance scheme, like people would pay money in and then they would have the right to, to take that money out when they need to take time off. Um, so comparatively, it's, I mean, it would function similar to like Social Security or Medicare, or other, other social insurance programs like that. Um, I think it's partially a question of values and whether we think that uh, people in the U.S. should live in dignity. I mean, everyone is going to be born and they're all going to die and probably get sick at some point, so it'd be nice to uh, support them in that process. And at the same time, a lot of the people, uh, we've been subsidizing a lot of uh, the way that we live on, like, low, with uh, the work of low income, mostly women and often immigrant women. Um, who do the, like a lot of the child care, elder care, like domestic care work in this country uh, for minimum wage or around there, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in, in the end, we set our budget and what we decide is a priority for our nation is what we're gonna have money for. And uh, the policies that specifically paid family leave um, the, uh, and then the Family Act um, sorry, specifically those policies are created, they're well thought, they have a budget scheme in mind, and uh, it's something, at least the Family Act, is something where employees and employers pay into, and it's a social insurance fund, so there is money for it if we decide that we care about people's lives, and beyond dignity, or beyond dignity, beyond need meeting, yeah. we're allowing people to you know, have freedom to live a life that they choose in a way that they choose beyond just meeting the baseline need. Everyone deserves happiness. Um, it, how do you think we can clarify what we really mean by our values in the policy making process? So I'm, I frequently think about um, David Elwood's original plan for welfare reform in the 90s, which was a lot more compassionate than the, the current cash assistance programs we have now. And uh, I think a lot of his ideas sort of 
took on a life of their own, and even though like he did espouse a lot of values about equity and fairness to uh, to folks uh, looking for assistance and trying to get back on their feet. Um, the tagline became end welfare as we know it. Um, personal responsibility is a goal of ours. That's uh, independence is a goal of ours. It's a shared American value of ours. Um, and those values really coalesce into something quite different than what you would imagine them to be. So uh, my question is, how, how do we really be clear about our values and clear about what we hope to achieve uh, and not let our ideas get lost in the legislative machine? So I, I mean, I think that like framing this as like a as a family issue, an issue that like people contribute to. I mean, it is both a public good and that like we want to invest in like the health and future of our country and our well-being as it stands right now. Um, it's also something that exists both in the U.S. and worldwide. So this is not some sort of radical idea. We're not talking about. Uh, I mean, there are many other policy issues that are a little bit more far-fetched, but this exists in California. It exists in Rhode Island. It exists in New Jersey, and then there's new legislation in, in Washington State, Washington, D.C., and a number of other places. So I think it's partially, like, how can we reframe this as, like, a way that Americans can support their own families and that also we contribute to child development, maternal health, which is worsening in the U.S., um, uh, gender equality, and other sorts of things. Yeah. Um, frankly, we need to... Frankly, we need to start with culture change. Uh, we need to make it normal to value caretakers, to value domestic workers and shift workers and all of the people that make other work possible uh, rather than sort of idolizing this one idea of success. Um, yes, uh, by putting families first, we can get on the same page with values, but even if we're on the same page, if we do get a good paid family leave program, we're gonna see, uh, we're not gonna see equal utilization rates unless we address gender equality, unless we address uh, wage disparities. Yeah, definitely. Um, something you mentioned is um, sort of maybe an unintended consequence of the proposed plan that it would, it might incentivize uh, employers to discriminate against uh, young, young parents. Um, what, what frameworks would you employ to sort of avoid some of those unintended consequences? Usually, I mean, in, in our work, usually what we try and think about is like, like how would this policy uh, affect historically marginalized communities by gender, by race, at the intersection of those two things, uh, differently able people, that sort of thing. I mean, we, what we know about the, uh, the Family Medical Leave Act, for example, is that it did enable some mostly affluent, mostly white people to take time off when they need it, but only people that can afford to take unpaid leave. So in a way, it has exacerbated inequality, even though the idea behind it was to um, help families take care of themselves. So in thinking about any sort of future paid leave um, scheme or other types of social policies, like thinking through uh, what incentives uh, could be included in the policy or like, like how this will affect different populations. Um, one of the things that we have seen from other countries is that it's really important to try and get men in particular to take leave, so often to help so that women are not still disproportionately shouldering the majority of, of the care work in this country, both for, like in terms of paid leave and unpaid leave as well, and unpaid work in their, in their families. So something, making sure that, you know, language around paid leave is gender neutral, but that there's also an incentive for the second parent or caregiver in a family to take it um, and making sure that it's, the pay is high enough so that our lowest income workers have the ability to take time off. Um, when California first implemented their paid leave scheme, they were, the, the amount of money that people would get if they took paid leave was just 55% of their wage. So if you're a minimum wage earner and you are only getting 55% of your income when you have a baby, it's still not really affordable to live in San Francisco on 55% of minimum wage. So bumping that up, especially for low-income workers, is really, really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, California recently did bump that wage replacement up mm -hmm. by... Um, I think to about 70%. To yeah. about 70%. And um, in, or in order to encourage men to take paid family leave in San Francisco, uh, in San Francisco, men get 100% wage replacement rates for um, taking paid family leave, and that encouraged utilization rates as well. Yeah, 
I think this also brings up the question of um, the drawbacks and benefits to targeted versus universal programs. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, on one hand, targeted programs can somehow like single out some of the most marginalized people in our society and really draw negative attention to them. Um, but that's where we need to foster equity, right? Mm -hmm. um, so could you speak to some of the, the perils of that? Of targeted approaches? Yeah. yeah. Well, you can't just capture everybody with a targeted approach, and often you isolate the community that you're hoping to serve, and there's a stigma associated with it as well, especially if you're getting vouchers for things and waiting in line forever. Um, for example, if you're, if you're trying to get food for your kids and you have to wait in, in front of a food shelter for an hour early in the morning with people walking by in front of you, there's a certain stigma associated with that for trying to provide for your family. And we see this all the time in education as well with um, voucher, education voucher programs being offered for community colleges, but not for four-year universities. What we're doing is we're saying that people are worth a certain value. And maybe the numbers show that that's where the impact is, but we're not centering the human, we're centering the statistic in that sense. So, uh, yeah, and then also universal approaches have a problem with ignoring marginalized communities. So I guess the big question is how do you balance both to make sure that a policy really does address the need that you want it to rather, and the people that you want it to serve rather than your stereotype or perception of what a population needs. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can do that by including people in the policy making conversation and hiring the people with lived experience as well as uh, in our research design actually incorporating qualitative research. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I think that's great. And I, I remember hearing Virginia Eubanks recently talk about uh, her new book. And one of the things she mentioned is like, policy, if you're implementing a policy or a research question and you would be unwilling to participate in that policy itself, so that's probably a good gut check as to like whether, <laughs> whether you're on the right track. Um, but certainly, I think including the communities you're trying to serve in the research and policy making process, um, making sure, I, I think that I generally have more of a preference for um, universal policies than targeted. That's the approach that the Better Life Lab takes in thinking about paid leave, um, but making sure that we're, um, yes, designing policies or research um, with communities and for communities that have been historically excluded. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I think a historical approach to policy making is something that's often left out of the, pol the traditional policy making process. Um, we tend to speak in euphemisms when we um, design policy, like I was doing it earlier, saying marginalized populations rather than talking about, if I'm getting more specific, the way black women specifically were excluded from a lot of major social programs in the United States. Um, and now that's a direct result of you know, chattel slavery in the United States. Um, that is usually considered sort of irrelevant to our design um, process when it comes to social policy, but it's completely relevant. Um, and if you can speak to the ways that your work often tries to integrate uh, history when um, proposing policies, I'd, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, I mean, with the case of the Republican paid leave plan, and one of the issues with um, designing paid leave through Social Security mm -hmm. is that a lot of the populations that we're talking about, so like agricultural workers, domestic workers, like mostly like people of color, they're not a part of the Social Security. They were excluded from the Social Security Act. They're excluded from a lot of the labor protections in this country. So as we think through, be it retirement security, like unemployment, pay leave, whatever the policy is, I think that like looking at sort of, yeah, the construction of that policy, like where did it come from, who was included, who was not, how is that changing? I mean, right now, um, more people work it, sort of in uh, contract hourly work, and so even if they had been included in our safety net before, they're probably not included anymore now, given the, the changing structure of work itself, so, yeah. I'm curious about how this applies to your work as well with yeah. family-centered social policy. Yeah, family-centered social policy absolutely loves historical approaches to uh, policy building. Um, and I think a lot of that is not just like a, a sort of historical research, but directly bringing in the people who are going to use these programs to the policy-making conversation. Um, people who are going to benefit from these programs should have a say in how they're designed and how they operate. Um, rather than sort of 
going to the technocrats and the, the people with fancy degrees, uh, calling out myself here. Um, <laughs> but including those folks at the table is really critical. Yeah. Any other last words before we wrap up and go to our second panel? No? All right. So with that, I think I'm going to welcome the education team up to the stage. Thank you, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, we are going to go ahead and jump right into our second conversation where I hope we continue to grapple with some of these same questions but bring it into the education space. Um, I've invited with me two of my colleagues from the education program at New America. Um, They're working on two distinct projects that I think could serve well as case studies to begin to unpack some of these questions around how do you intervene with care, how do you design policies with different communities in mind and ensure equity. Um, so we have Abigail Swisher, who um, is with our K-12 um, program, and her work revolves around college and career readiness. And today she's going to be talking about some of the work she's been doing in the last year on youth apprenticeship. And we also have Ernest Usuego, who is um, a program associate with our higher ed team, who does a lot of research and writing on a host of different issues, but today is going to be talking about um, predictive analytics in higher education. So just to start off, can you guys give sort of a brief overview of what your work is? And we'll start with some of the positive aspects, the promise, who, if we do this well, who can benefit? And then also jump into some of the, some of the challenges and ethical concerns that are com coming to the fore as you um, research this further. Okay, I can start. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you, Jenny, uh, and thank you all for being here. Like uh, Jenny mentioned, um, the topic area that I'm currently working on in New America is predictive analytics and its use in higher education. Uh, predictive analytics being the idea that uh, institutions are taking historical data uh, and then using it to make predictions about what, uh, or really I should say forecast, what student behaviors lead to success. Um, and learn more about like what uh, types of behaviors uh, like students make in general. Um, I think the great promise of predictive analytics uh, and, and, and in general the conversation about data in higher education and data use is that data uh, used ethically and effectively has the potential to teach us more about student success than we've ever known. Uh, it can inform the way that we learn, it can inform the way uh, that we intervene when we know that students are off course. Um, and, and there are a number of other things, right, that n having access to data uh, can teach us. Uh, but the key in all of that, right, is ethical and effective use. Um, I think if done properly, pr everyone, all students benefit from predictive analytics. I say all students, but like students at the in institutions that are practicing this, because it's still relatively new work. Um, I actually think that uh, first and foremost, uh, students from historically underserved communities can benefit the most from predictive analytics, and I'm sure we'll get into that uh, through this conversation. Yeah, um, and thank you, Jenny, thank you, Ernest, and thank you all for being here today. Um, so as Jenny mentioned, my colleagues and I have embarked on this year-long project around uh, the equity dimensions of youth apprenticeship, and if you aren't familiar with youth apprenticeship, or if your idea of youth apprenticeship is still, you know, like Benjamin Franklin, you know, uh, slaving away in the workshop, um, youth apprenticeship has come a long way since our traditional conception of it, although it is, um, you know, a many centuries old uh, program design. The idea being that it's a partnership between uh, three institutions, the high school, a post-secondary partner, and industry, um, to provide students with paid on-the-job learning, um, and along with classroom learning um, in a post-secondary setting for post-secondary credit. Um, and ideally, at the end of it, it should lead students, we believe, um, in a high quality program to a family sustaining wage job and a path forward in a specific industry. Um, so functionally what this looks like is a student either during the school day or after school going to a work site, getting paid on the job mentorship in a workplace um, and either during the day or on the, week the weekends, evenings, uh, also going to a post-secondary institution 
um, to receive college level coursework in their industry area. Uh, at the end, they should get an industry recognized credential or something that really validates um, the work experience that they've had. Um, and as you know, this program model has become more popular in the past few years, um, questions are really arising about who we see youth apprenticeship as for. Um, there are a lot of potential benefits that um, it can accrue to a student. Um, for instance, getting post-secondary credit early um, can reduce time and debt to a degree. It provides students a really stable pathway with built-in mentors um, to get to and through post-secondary and into a family-sustaining wage career. Um, and it also means that for students who by necessity have to work while they are in high school, um, they're not working at McDonald's, they're not working at Subway, um, they're working in a workplace um, that will put, like not only provide them with a living wage, um, but also move their careers forward. Um, so it, that's, I think, a really tremendous potential. And so, you know, as we are thinking about who this is for, very often the discussion has come to this as a solution for students who we know traditionally struggle to get to it and through college and into family sustaining wage careers. Um, specifically, very often this is put forward as a solution for low income students and students of color. Um, and as much as, you know, there is, I think, a tremendous like potential benefit to that, we also have a pretty pernicious history as a nation um, around tracking and vocational education um, that has to be a part of the conversation today. And that was really the starting point of this project. Uh, it's a year-long sort of listening campaign across the country done with the support of the Annie E. Casey Foundation, um, at the end of which we're hoping to have a, a better framework for what equitable program design would look like as these programs uh, proliferate. Thank you, Abigail. Can um, Ernest, can you say a little bit more about what some of the challenges are or sort of the wrong turns that have been taken with your particular work? Because I think it's quite interesting and would lead us to the conversation. Yeah, certainly. So I think um, I think right now the, the challenge that institutions in particular are grappling with uh, in relation to using predictive analytics is just this idea of practicing ethical and effective use uh, while mitigating some of the effects uh, and some of the kind of built-in negatives, unfortunately, that we know about using data. Um, we live in, unfortunately, like a time where there's still, we're still grappling with the effects of structural uh, inequity. Um, earlier, Eliza mentioned the work of Virginia Eubanks. Uh, Kathy O'Neill also wrote, wrote a great book uh, called Weapons of Math, Math Destruction, uh, talking about um, the idea that like, uh, currently, uh, algorithms are, are, while like they happen to the benefit of maybe like rich uh, and and uh, the rich and, and wider communities, uh, they're being sort of forced onto uh, people from lower income and uh, communities and, and and communities of color. Um, and uh, I think like what's key to understand there is like we're grappling with this in this time. Um, this idea that like the rich get people and people uh, and and the poor get uh, algorithms um, is just this idea that like prior to prior to algorithms um, poor people it's not like they were get you know it's not like we were getting uh, fantastic service right from people either right this idea of like grappling with whether or not we're using algorithms individually versus whether or not we're uh, really like thinking through uh, the human ways in which like al algorithms can affect us uh, making sure that we're looking at Make sure we're looking at how predict, uh, predictive analytics and, and data uh, uh, can have like pitfalls uh, related around like you know tracking um, like all of, all of that is key. I think that's the discussion right now that institutions are having. How do we use this data uh, in a way that and how do, and how do we make sure that we're not um, bringing to life all of the uh, all of the uh, inequities that we know exist uh, because we're using it? How we how we like. Uh, and a part of this is interventions too, is right? Like what does this data tell us about the way that our students are and how do we practice the most human part of this um, intervention in a way that really does highlight the needs uh, of our historically underserved communities? I think what's interesting and what I found interesting about both of your work is that there seemed to be this very slippery slope between wanting to do good and having well-intentioned policy um, and, then, and then tracking. And, and, and so there's a very 
thin line between this becoming sort of very paternalistic and reinforcing some of those deficit perspectives or stereotypes that we have of certain communities. Abigail, you wrote an interesting piece um, about uh, vocational schooling and how that might haunt this new sort of resurgence of apprenticeship. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, so I think, I think your point's well taken, especially, um, you know, the anecdote that comes to mind was a time that we were meeting um, with the State Youth Apprenticeship Council um, in this past year, and um, the college and career readiness person from the State Department of Education was talking about, you know, what she sees as, as the benefit of this program. Um, and specifically to your point about paternalism, um, I'm thinking about what she said about who she sees this program is for. She, she told me, this program is for the students who think they're going to college, but they're not. Um, they don't have savings, they don't have the support, and we know that they're gonna drop out within a semester, so we want them to go into this program instead. Um, and that strikes me as the height of paternalizing, however well-intentioned it may be. Um, I think very often when we are thinking about um, you know, these programs that help um, guide students towards careers, we fail to, to think about their aspirations um, and that like they have every right to the full amount of choice that students with the most privilege get in determining their career pathways and that like as much as we have to balance the, um, the need to be practical and talk to students frankly about the challenges that they are going to face um, no matter what they choose for their career, um, I, I think that you know, there's a fine line to be walked between that and, and shunting students onto a path because we believe certain things based on, based on data about their opportunities. Can we, this is something we often don't get to in these conversations, but how do you avoid that? How do we fix that? Have you all seen in your work um, people that are designing or implementing some of these programs well that have been able to avoid some of those unintended consequences? What do those conversations look like? Yeah, well, so, I mean, that's sort of the million dollar question for this particular initiative. Um, and, and what we're trying to, you know, hear, these programs are, are very new. Um, they haven't undergone rigorous evaluation that tells us, like, demographically how they're serving students yet. So it's, it's an open question. But I think, like, the first thing that people need to do when they're designing a program like this is to take care in what data they're collecting, how quickly they're reporting it before uh, programs are scaled, and also like actually know and be able you know, to tell others who they believe their programs are for. Um, and that to me is the first step in, in sort of figuring out what are, what are tremendously uh, complex and multifaceted equity concerns. Um, I think you know, so far I've really only spoken about equity concerns as they pertain to low-income youth and youth of color. But there are so many other like aspects to this issue related to you know um, English language learners, to uh, women who are disproportionately barred from certain um, apprenticeable fields, uh, to students with disabilities. Um, it's it's complex. So the short answer is we don't know yet. I think that's also the million dollar question with uh, institutions grappling on how to use predictive analytics. Um, it's just this idea that. Uh, Colleges are beginning to realize that uh, you can have all the data in the world, you can have all the tools in the world, uh, you can have the most complex algorithms, but the way that we interpret that data as humans and the way that we uh, intervene, like that, the way that data informs interventions is uh, critical to this work as well. Um, I think an excellent example and probably the most talked about example in the field right now uh, is Georgia State. They'll tell you that they worked with the Education Advisory Board to create this uh, set of tools and algorithms that helped really pinpoint uh, places where students were struggling some, and, helped, and it helped them discover right, areas to intervene early uh, and really uh, touch on students. But they will also tell you that before, prior to having uh, this whole set of predictive analytics, uh, the ratio of students to guidance counselors at the school was 700 to 1. Um, and after implementation, uh, they took deliberate steps to also uh, to also really step up the way that they were uh, addressing like hum human needs with with humans. You know, decrease their ratio of uh, uh, to 300 to one, which is still large, but <laughs> but it's much better, right? Um, and really begin to target interventions. Really begin to use this data in a way that informed, uh, uh, sorry, that informed their interventions um, and help them focus on like what to talk with students about, leading from a wellness uh, mindset instead of from a deficit mindset. Um, starting off to simple things, like starting off emails 
um, as kind of nudges to students saying like, we're proud of you and we understand that this is hard work. Uh, here are the ways, like here are the resources available um, and not just like warnings, you know what I mean? That are like, hey, you failed this test, you're now like 25, uh, 20, you're like in this uh, group of people who are likely to uh, drop out of school. Um, and so, you know, I think that's part of that work as well that's happening. Uh, and I think like uh, schools are, are, are across the board um, from all like walks of the higher education landscape are discovering that uh, data is critical, predictive analytics certainly help interpret that, um, but the way that we as humans take that and then in, and, and interact with our fellow humans is also critical. I think that part of being able to have that forethought that was involved in being able to do something like that that was successful involves having, and we spoke about this earlier, diverse representation around the table when these programs are being designed. Um, who has been, in, in designing these programs, who has been at the table? And what conversations have happened? Have people started, started using this historical lens in that work? Um, yeah, I would say, um, I would say that uh, the number of the institutions that we've talked to who are really doing this work well are putting a lot of thought into who their personnel on this work is and who their team is. Uh, so not just like which vendors, outside vendors are you using are they producing uh, the type of tool that you think can serve your student body? And, and are you talking about them, or talking with them about the effects of um, like negatives and historical data on your algorithms? Uh, but also thinking at an institutional level, from the student to uh, the IT and IR institutional reporting departments, um, who's involved in this work on the inside, and how are our teams like working together with these institutions uh, to? identify potential issues that might arise, identify unintended consequences that might ar arise as well. I think it takes like a certain amount of bravery to be able to admit some, acknowledge some of these problems at the onset and say these are the things that we know historically, these are the problems that we know can arise and start building from there. And I don't think that's something that hop happens very often. Abigail, do you have anything? Else? Yeah, um, so I, you know, I, I wouldn't wish to speak for all initiatives across the country, um, primarily um, because it's it's a really diverse landscape, and these are these are highly localized programs. I will say that from what I have seen, we have a lot a lot of work left to do to make sure that the like policy and pro programmatic planning level staff uh, working on these programs represent the students that they are hoping to serve. Um, primarily, my observation with these folks is that they are uh, mostly mostly white and mostly male. Um, and I think that going forward, that has like bound to affect um, how these programs uh, will turn out. Um, in addition to thinking about you know the diversity of uh, and inclusiveness of the policy and programmatic level you know staffing, you also have to think about how you're training people to confront um, implicit bias, which I think is is going to be um, one of the trickiest um, things to do with these programs. Um, you know, when we talk to people about it, particularly when it comes to the level, it's funny you mentioned counselors on the post-secondary level. On the secondary level, um, implicit bias from counselors is one thing that people bring up uh, again and again, that like students are coming to them and saying like, I know that the counselor recommended me for this because she doesn't think I can go to college. Um, or, you know, on the flip side, my teacher told me I shouldn't do this program because I need to go to four-year college. Uh, to succeed, and so at, at all levels, um, there's there are issues both with inclusion and staffing, um, and confronting the implicit biases of the people who are already in the room. I think, right? It's probably safe to say in both of our fields that uh, like people are coming to realize um, exactly what was mentioned. I think in our first the first half of this panel that uh, you know if you're not talking to the people who are going to be affected <laughs> by these things, then you're not really doing this work as effectively as you can. So they just flagged me and said that we have three minutes. Got so it, maybe one person <laughs> can answer this one. Um, I want to go back to this question that ar arose earlier about the tension, be tension between universal and targeted approaches. Um, have you seen that tension arise in your particular work? Um, do you think one has worked more effectively than the other? Have any general thoughts around that? I don't think I have a short answer to this question. <laughs> so, <laughs> Do you want me to go ahead? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I think that in education in general, um, you know, what we know like about universal versus targeted approaches is that we need targeted approaches for students um, who are traditionally underserved in our school systems because they are getting less, not more, right now um, than the average student. 
across the board, so we do need those targeted approaches. And we also know that when we have universal approaches to interventions in education, whatever they may be, then in general, the people with the most social capital, the parents with the most social capital, are the ones to immediately snap up those opportunities for their children. Um, and I think about that a lot in the context of youth apprenticeship as it begins to funnel students towards high wage, high growth, family sustaining wage jobs um, that have sort of a greater level of prestige than say, you know, plumbing has traditionally had, um, that a universal approach to these types of programs will mean that they're only utilized by the most privileged. Yeah, I agree. Uh, did you want to wrap up? No. no. <laughs> uh, cool. Uh, I can try to take a minute. Uh, I, <laughs> I completely agree. Uh, Abigail, yeah, like one of the most frustrating things about uh, uh, policy, education policy in general, is I think that there is like a, this pointing towards um, an approach that's all inclusive approach, but but Abigail, you're 100 percent right. Uh, at the end of the day, when we do that, the people with the most social capital benefit the most. Um, in predictive analytics, it's it's of particular uh, importance to focus on like structural and, and local uh, interventions because different communities respond to different things different ways. Um, and if you're creating once one uh, one size fits all uh, interventions for entire college communities where students are coming from different walks of life and backgrounds, uh, you're guaranteed to, you know, I mean, rub, rub people the wrong way and um, have an, those adverse effects and those unintended consequences. Yeah. I think it also speaks to uh, what Maya mentioned earlier about the scarcity framework and that if we really instill equity, and that sometimes means that we're funneling resources, extra resources to particular groups of people because they need it. And I think that people are afraid that that means that there is less resources for them. And so that's sort of a question we also have to grapple with, right? That there is not a finite amount of resources that we really have to focus these where they need to be focused and, and ensure that people don't get forgotten in the design of something. Um, I wanna thank you both for being here. I, this was a short conversation, but I hope one that sparks more conversations throughout the day, throughout our breaks and in our reception. Um, so I just wanna thank you all for being here and listening to us and thank you both for coming on board and talking about the things that you're working on. So thank you. Um, really quick, we're going to start a question and answer uh, session. It's going to be 10 minutes. Um, we just want to let you know to be mindful of um, waiting until you get a mic. Um, but we'll go ahead and start right now. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. We wanted to get Elise up here. Sorry. <laughs> Got it, got it, got it. <laughs> and also, and Mayaka, Mayaka is up here, and mm -hmm. Roslyn is around. Also, if you have any questions for her, so, so, so how I, I'm trying to <clears throat> find out how you divide, determine the dividing line between the the uh, millennials and the successive generation. Uh, uh, you know, use '96 or '94. How how is that uh, year? Maybe people determine to be the boundary line between the millennials and or uh, you know. I, I, I'm trying to think where how they determine like 81 to 96 or 81 to 94. How those how those are the boundaries between the millennials and the other generations. I'll speak as a as a millennial. I think that I don't know how they defined it. I think they just really drew a line in the sand, and I think that's why the conversation we've had is how much can we really focus on these ge these generational groups of people? How much can these labels really define us? Um, so, question to that is, I mean, we don't know. This question is for Abigail. Um, what role do you think for-profit institutions play in the apprenticeship model that a lot of young people are going into, especially in areas where you see advertisements for you know, these for-profit institutions that oftentimes pull resources out of people that are already cash-strapped? And um, you know, does that impact? apprenticeship models or should they be nonprofit post-secondary institutions versus for-profit institutions? I think that I could safely speak for my program when I say that um, ideally it should not be a for-profit institution providing uh, the post-secondary. I think that that to us wouldn't wouldn't be a high quality model. Um, but you know, to speak more to that, it was funny um, that you that you bring up for-profits in the context of this conversation because we, we had a convening around youth apprenticeship um, here in this space last week. Um, and it's something that um, a participant brought up to us, that youth apprenticeship actually has great potential for young people 
who are struggling to um, find their way into post-secondary institutions to avoid getting sort of um, you know, into the clutches of for-profit institutions, the idea being that we make it easier for young people to, um, you know, to access these programs and stay on um, sort of a, a safely guardrailed path um, through post-secondary so that when they leave high school, they're not floundering and, um, and ending up, you know, sort of prey to those institutions, which I thought was interesting and something I hadn't considered before. Any other questions? My question is for anyone from the first panel on the family leave. I wonder if you think uh, the changing landscape of work in terms of the shared economy has what impact that has on policy. Sorry, I had a little bit of a hard time hearing you. Could you repeat that just a, little, a bit louder? In terms of the change in landscape of work and the rising of the shared economy like Uber and Airbnb, what kind of impact that has on policies relating to families and equity? Yeah, that's something that we're actually very concerned about um, and interested in because a lot, of, uh, a lot of our assumptions about paid family leave and other labor policies are um, well, we assume that people are going to like a nine to five job and that they have like healthcare through their employer. But what we know is that more and more workers, particularly millennial workers, um, they are working more hours, unpredictable hours. They probably don't have benefits. Um, and this is true not just for people who like, or like they work for Uber or Lyft, but for other others as well. So we're sort of trying to explore what the difference would be in terms of like a universal insurance model versus portable benefits. Like how do we capture the, the most workers and also like our most vulnerable workers to make sure that they have um, access to those policies. It's not like a, a, an exact science because a, at this point we're still like in the process of developing those proposals um, partially because this is a phenomenon that is perhaps more prevalent in the US than it is in other countries that um, already have paid leave policies in place or already have more uh, uh, additional labor regulations around um, health insurance, paid leave, and other, and other policies. So ideally, um, I think in an ideal world, whatever the, the paid leave policy that we implement uh, federally, which is probably not going to happen in the near term, but ideally that, that, that policy would capture uh, both like different types of workers working different hours. So it's not like under paid family and medical leave right now, you have to, in order to qualify, you have to work for an employer that has more than 50 employees. You have to have been at that employer for over a year. Um, so already, like almost half the, the labor force does not qualify even just for unpaid leave. So as we think about policies in the future, we wanna make sure that we're including part-time workers, hourly workers, contract workers, um, all the workers, like agricultural, domestic workers, that aren't included in our current labor systems. So, yeah. Hi, I have a question for Eliza. I was wondering how, uh, in your thoughts about in BLL's work on paid family leave, you're thinking about families that are not necessarily traditional and that they don't involve a birth, but could be adoption or foster mm -hmm. parents or older siblings taking care of younger siblings, anything like that? Yeah, so we, uh, our approach to paid family leave, like we think that it's really important to be as inclusive as possible and that, uh, and this is part of uh, our criticism of the Republican plan is that um, families take lots of different forms. So I, it, it is important to recognize the, the diversity in that structure. And so making sure that um, we like to talk about the concept of family as something of love, blood, or choice. It, you know, it might be that the person who's caring for your child is your neighbor. It might be a grandparent. It might be, you know, a same-sex partner. It, like we want to make sure that um, we're enabling people to care for those those structures. So um, we've worked with organizations like uh, A Better Balance to sort of talk through um, what that language should look like so that we um, include adoptive parents, foster parents, um, LGBT, the LGBT community, or even, um, let's say, I, I, this is something that we've thought about a lot in, in response to sort of police shootings, for example, that like often the people who end up caring for the children of people who have died 
may not be biologically related to those children. They may not be qualified. They might, because of that, under law, not be qualified to certain benefits, even though they have assumed, uh, lovingly resumed responsibility for um, these families that have, you know, uh, been targeted by the police. So but that uh, is something yeah, that we're very much uh, interested in, in further developing. Yeah. Um, so my question is for Abigail and Ernest. Um, I'm curious about what correlations can be made, if any, with the new youth apprentice movement and linking it in some way to school voucher program, the school voucher program. And I know years ago it was meant to really support those in the lower income strata. And it's not really becoming a program that's really supporting that demographic anymore. It's really been shift, like the, the focus has shifted and others have really kind of figured out how to make it work to their benefit who aren't necessarily of that demographic that was it, it was intended to support. And I'm curious with the youth apprentice model taking hold and also just this movement for many students, uh, millennials wanting to go to um, more trade school uh, and more even, um, you know, like non-traditional, you know, for you know, for your program degree programs, like where you think there's a correlation, if at all, um, and if it's an issue that needs to be thought about now as a possible potential problem later, and if so, like what what can be done now to ensure that that doesn't happen? Yeah, um, I think that's a that's a fantastic question, um, and it's an interesting parallel one that I hadn't um, hadn't considered before. But I think you know, there's a real danger in that as these programs um, become seen. As, as you know, I mentioned earlier, sort of more highly desirable um, and, um, you know, the type of education that people want to move into roles that they're interested in. Um, and and how, we, how we guard against that, I think, is really an open question. And I think Jenny's framework of sort of targeted versus universal programs is, is a one way to think about it. But it's, it's a really thorny problem and, and one that we're, you know, we're excited to continue to work on. Regarding the earlier panel, we, we heard that a woman who's homeless has a family and has to wait on a, a long line or use a lot of time to get food for her family. Uh, is there anything like Amazon home delivery, uh, an equivalency that could be provided by a, the local jurisdiction uh, that might make sense in a case like that? There can't be too many cases like that, but something. And I wondered, uh, does this vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction across the country? It must, I would think. Did you hear that clearly? Yeah. So um, your your question is uh, related to like how we provide food benefits, basically, and whether we can improve that. Or okay. Um, I also don't know if Rosalind would like to respond to that if she's in the audience. But uh, yes, you're right. Yeah. So I believe that was brought up in the context of stigma in accessing programs. So I. Uh, that would be cool, an Amazon delivery system that brought food to people, but you would have to make sure that you could get that to rural communities. You, you'd have to make sure that you, there's so many different aspects to that. And I guess in the context of this panel, which is about care and education and creating those inclusive policies, yes, uh, there are technological answers, but uh, we just need to make sure that we are considering the needs of the population when we are creating those technological answers and avoiding um, creating extra stigma or consequences that you know we are unexpected. But we we can check in on those by talking to the people that we are serving. Yeah, I think I want to add because I think that is something that had been proposed earlier this, this year. Somebody said about um, giving out meals like Blue Apron to communities. I think, I, I can't remember who's, yeah. Um, so I think you run the risk of, again, having a paternalistic strategy, right? Like to dictate what pe what food people are going to get and then you you have to dictate the quantity of food. And I think um, that's a slippery slope and I don't, I don't think that um, that's necessary. I think also like I, my concern is like why don't like why do we allow so many people to like endure like the humiliation of being economically insecure and impoverished, which is not going to be solved by delivering food to their house. Like they probably need money for other things like medical care. They probably need money, you know, to pay rent. Um, so I think that you know thinking about like the whole picture of like a household budget, there emotional uh, and other needs, like that is really, really important. And I think that um, to respond, I think to previous comments about 
targeted versus universal approaches, a lot of what we think about is whether there's like a yes and approach. So in thinking about paid leave, we want it to apply to everyone. We want it to um, be gender neutral specifically since women have, have historically done more care work. But making sure, for example, that like the, the wage reimbursement rate is higher for lower income communities or that people who haven't done care work are encouraged to do so. So like making sure that we that there's like additional supports for certain communities baked into the policy, but that most people will have access is sort of the way that we, we like to think about uh, social policies. Yeah. Who has a mic? So for the education folks, it strikes me that a lot of what you are talking about or the, the barriers to some of the high quality apprenticeship implementation comes down to mindset and low expectations. And until replacing or raising the expectations of a workforce that has high expectations for students and young adults is a big task we've been undertaking for many, many years now. Have you seen any um, policy design or programs that have been able to make the shift to think about high quality apprenticeships and who needs them most, sort of aside from getting in those adults who can think about it in that way of, of the design that you talked about, Abigail, in the beginning? Have you seen any policy design that sort of helps to circumvent the adults with low expectation that still produces high quality outcomes for students? Um, the short answer being- and, or, or are you studying it as part of this work? Yeah, so that the latter. We are, we're studying it as part of this work, um, hoping to, you know, sort of over the course of years, be able to lift up early success. Um, I think like beyond, you know, as you speak to the mindsets of adults, beyond that, there also has to be some accountability to make sure that those mindsets um, aren't infusing program design. And so in these early stages, what we're really looking for and, and what we hope that people will do is collect and publish um, very clear demographic data about who they are serving and how well it is serving those students after they uh, complete their apprenticeship. So that's what we're, we're really hoping to see in these early stages. I have a question about the paid family leave. Um, you've referenced other countries kind of throughout your commentary, and I would just be curious to know what countries you look to to kind of emulate their policies and kind of what is it about their policies that, that you think is particularly strong um, and that could maybe be adapted here in the United States. Yeah, so we, um, I think that there are, uh, a couple years ago actually we had an event called uh, paid leave leapfrogging and sort of trying to understand like what mistakes we can sort of see in other countries and what are things that we can learn. Um, we did an evaluation last summer looking sort of the landscape of like how much, how long should paid leave ideally be in order to maximize um, infant well-being and attachment, uh, maternal health, gender equality, and then business outcomes. And our conclusion, and this has been, been reinforced by like, public health officials out at UCLA, is that uh, we probably need uh, at least six months um, for both parents, of whatever gender they are, uh, to enable all of those things, um, especially for, I mean, for early attachment. Uh, there's also interesting data looking at the fact that if leave is too short, women won't take it. If leave is too long, it becomes very difficult for them to re-enter the labor market. So. There are countries that provide like three years of paid leave, but then they have a lot of issues with women's labor force participation. Um, and then it's interesting, uh, Iceland in particular, uh, we like always idealize Scandinavia, but um, like Denmark, for example, actually has an issue with like women's labor force participation because a lot of women will, as the default, just take paid family leave and the men will continue to work. And that's when the wage gap grows and inequality around who's taking care of children or the elderly or you know, the disabled grow. Um, so what Iceland did was to create sort of like their, their paid leave is gender neutral, but they have what they call like a daddy quota or a bonus. So if both partners take paid leave, um, then they will get additional time, which helps them sort of pay for infant care. So it's, and it's really in a very short period of time, 
bumped up the number of men taking leave. And what they've also seen is that when men take leave um, in the first like year of an infant's life, it helps to equalize the amount of unpaid care work they do in the household, either of the child or housework and that sort of thing. So it's really uh, in a very short time period, like altered people's attitudes and perceptions of, of care work just in, in that context. So even within, you know, homogeneous Scandinavia, there's like a lot of diversity in terms of who's taking leave, who's providing care, um, and how that affects the society writ large. So, yeah. It looks like we're out of time, everyone. So I want to thank you all for your very thoughtful questions. Um, <laughs> It looks like we're going to take a short break. Um, there seems to be some refreshments outside, and then we will be back in 15 minutes. Thank you.